Lord, I thank God for the singing and thank God for all that God's done for us doing this. Let me do say that I appreciate you being here today. I want you to turn, if you will, to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. We'll finish up where we left off last week. Uh, I'll not go back and preach what I preached last week. Don't want to finish it today. <laughs> uh, but I think it's a tremendous psalm. And we're thankful for what God's showing us out of this. I want to begin reading in verse number 7 of Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse number 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Our Father, we ask you today for a fresh anointing and a touch from on high. We pray that you'd open the understanding and the minds of your people, that they may understand and see that which is being taught and preached from this infallible book. We thank you, the Lord, today that we can come to a holy God of glory. Lord, we don't, you don't owe us a thing, but we owe you everything. As this Thanksgiving season is upon us, may it not just be this day or this Thursday, but Lord, may we thank you every day of our life for delivering our miserable souls. For giving us the grace that we need to get through day by day. I ask you now if it be one in our midst today that does not know you as personal Savior. Dear God that you would touch that heart. You would open their eyes and draw them unto yourself and save them before it's everlasting too late. We do praise you and we give you the glory for what's already accomplished. But for what's going to take place thus far, we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalmist has given to us in Psalms 19 a tremendous psalm concerning the glory of God. I like that statement where it says in verse number 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. I believe with all my heart and with all my soul, everything that God wants us to do, of all the things He wants us to do, the major thing is to bring glory to Him. Everything that we do, everything that we say, every message I preach, every witness that we have, it should be for the glory of God. I say to you today, it's sad to say that in our churches, much of the glory is gone. Many churches today will meet and there'll be no glory of God in it. There'll be no glory preached about. There'll be no glory experienced. There'll be no glory anywhere around it. Because I'm afraid that Ichabod has been written over the door. That word simply means the glory has departed. And may God forgive us today if the glory has departed from our life or if the glory ever departs from this church. I want Calvary Baptist Church to be what is called a glory church. I want it to be one where God's glory is received and where God's glory is preached and where the glory of God is seen. May God help us in this day that we are living never to get a place in our life where the glory has departed. I asked a question. I entitled this message last week and continue using this title this day. Where is the glory? Where is the glory in your life? Where is the glory in my life concerning walking with God, concerning the will of God, concerning the worship of God, concerning the work of God, concerning the way of God? Where is the glory in our life when we get to the place in our day that we look into this book and we've missed Jesus Christ and we miss the glory that God wants us to see in this? Now, God wants all glory. God deserves all glory. And may God receive that in our heart and in our life. 
There's some special verses here concerning the Word of God. I gave you a little three-point outline last time, and it's very simple. Concerning the glory of God, there's the works of God, the first six verses. Concerning the glory of God, there is the Word of God, verses 7 through 11. I'll be looking at mainly that today. And so we see the Word of God here. God shows us His glory in His Word. The glory will never depart from the Word. It will always be a glorious word. The glory will never depart from the heavens. It will always be a glorious heaven. But I'm sad to say the third part of this little simple outline is the workman of God's glory. The glory will depart and has departed and can depart. And sad to say will depart from some uh, from the workman of God. God has established in his word concerning his word that it is forever and it shall never be done away with. That's the reason we can lay our head on our pillow tonight and no matter what God has told us, that will not change. God is an immutable God. What does that mean? That God will never change. If God will never change, that means Jesus Christ will never change because Jesus Christ is God. And so therefore, if Jesus will never change, that means the Word of God will never change because Jesus is the Word of God. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. These little simple thoughts that I will share with you this morning, that's what they are. They're simple. And may God help us to get a hold of the fact and I ask you this morning to be honest with yourself first of all be honest with God God knows who you are God knows who I am God knows my heart he knows everything about me I can't tell God anything that God does not know but then be honest with yourself many people have fooled themselves and many people although God will reveal to them a truth in the word of God they will not do what God tells them tells them to do concerning that truth but as we look at briefly this morning, that's a sad statement I made, isn't it, briefly? But as, as we look at uh, in the Word of God this morning, may we look at the works of God and the Word of God. And I want to uh, spend most of my time today on the Word of God. These verses, uh, there's three little elements in each statement concerning the Word of God. He gives us six effects of the Word of God, six titles concerning the Word of God, and six attributes concerning the Word of God. It's a fascinating study and a fascinating thing as we can walk with him and see it in our life. May the glory not depart. I'll share that with you in just a little bit. But we see first of all, I want you to look in verse number 7. You'll notice the first two words, the law. That law is referring to the word of God. What does it do? The law of the Lord is perfect. And it tells us converting the soul here. So that statement that we find concerning here, this first thing that it says and the title that I want to share with you this morning concerning God's glory is the glory that's in the law. It tells of divine instructions. That's what I'm giving to you this morning. That's what the Holy Ghost has given to me. The law gives us instructions. It's the instructions that we are given that God tells us how to walk and how to do and what to do. And it's divine instructions relative to its character and to its conduct. You do know that the law concerning God's word is perfect. It never was given to save anybody because you can't keep the law. But I want to say to you, the law has always been perfect. There's no flaw in the law. The law is perfect. And thank God we see the perfect word of God tells us that, giving us instructions concerning the character and the conduct of this law. It is perfect. That is, it is without flaw. I say to you this morning, you're holding in your hand. If you have, and I don't make no bones about this. I don't care if it hair lips the devil. I want to tell you this. If you have anything other than your King James Bible, you need to get you a copy of the word of God. I need, you need to get the word of God. It's the only one that God puts his stamp of approval on. Somebody said, oh, you one of them King James Bible fanatics. No, I just believe the word. I just believe, thank God, God's perfect enough. God's good enough. And God's given us his perfect word and God's given us something we can stand on that I don't correct God. God corrects me. If the law is perfect, why do I correct it? If the law is pure, why do I correct it? If the word of God is right, why would I have to change it? And so therefore it's perfect without flaw or without defect. 
And what does it do? The, thank God the attribute of it. It restores the soul and refreshes the inner life as food does for the body. You cannot live spiritually if you don't have the food of God. You've got to have the Word of God. You've got to eat the Word of God. You've got to partake of the Word of God. You've got to feed on the Word of God. And so therefore, if God's going to get glory in my life, if God's going to get glory in your life, and the glory of God's going to be seen in our life, then we must have the law of God or the Word of God. And so the law tells of the instructions that's relative to the character and the conduct of our life and it's perfect without flaw or defect. It restores the soul and it refreshes the inner life as it goes by day by day. Not only do we see the law but we find also that it converts the soul but the testimony of the Lord verse 7 is sure making wise the simple. And so after David says that law is perfect, he tells us the testimony of the Lord tells of our witness and the divine witness to what God is and what we should be. This Bible testifies to the fact of who God is. Nowhere does this Bible set out to prove that there is a God. God just comes on the scene saying, in the beginning, God. And so we're going to know God and we're going to know Him personally. We must look into the Word of the God and the testimony that God gives us concerning Himself and concerning His way and His, uh, His will. And so the testimony of God tells of the divine witness to who God is and what we should be. It also tells us, thank God, that it is sure. The testimony of God, David says us, thank God it's sure. That is, it's reliable. You can rest assured that the Word of God is reliable. You can rest assured if God says it, it's so, it's settled, and it'll never change. And so it's reliable. It is worthy of being absolutely followed. I follow the Word of God because I follow God. You follow the Word of God because you follow God. We don't try to straighten this book out. The book straightens us out. And so therefore, if God's going to get glory, and the glory of God's going to be in my life, I must realize I have the law of God, thank God, that is uh, perfect and converting the soul, and the testimony of the Lord that's sure, making wise the simple. You are a wise person if you follow God. You are a wise person if you follow the Lord. God doesn't give you suggestions. To see some people and to hear some people and to hear some preachers, you would think God has given us the ten suggestions. But God did not give, suggest anything. God gave us His commandments. And so we have that. May God have the glory out of all of that. It's reliable. It's worthy of being absolutely followed. And what does it do? It makes wise the simple, giving practical guidance to the inexperienced. I was not experienced to following God when God saved me. I had never followed God before because I'd never been saved before. I didn't know God before God saved me. I knew about God, but I didn't know Him. It's a big difference. I may be preaching to someone here in this church today that knows about God. That's no big deal. Everybody knows that there's a God. The Bible says the devil even believes that there's a God. You'd have a hard time convincing him that there's no God. And so the devil believes and trembles, but he's hell bound in overdrive. Jesus Christ is the only one that can save you. Jesus Christ is the one that you look to, and he's the one that we follow. And so therefore we follow him, and it makes us wise, and he gives us uh, that experience. I didn't have any experience on worshiping God. I didn't have any experience on following God. But when God saved me, thank God that experience from day to day gets better and better. And so I'm thankful this morning that I can say to you the glory of God should be in my life by experience. And so when I do something for the glory of God, while well, witness for God and preach for God and talk for God and anything I do for God, the glory of God should shine forth out of me as God intended for it to be. So I ask you today, where is your glory? Where is the glory of God in your life? Where is the glory of God in my life? Do people see the law of God that's testifying in my life? Do they see the testimony of God as a divine witness that's not only perfect but sure and reliable? And so that's some shouting ground right there. But David goes on and he says something else about this glorious word of God. And if the glory of God is 
this in my life. He says, the statures of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. You see the way he stacked this thing together? It goes hand in hand. He said it's a perfect word. It is a testimonial word. But the statutes tells of his divine directions that's designed to secure obedience or to check disobedience. He tells us to walk in the truth of life. Jesus is the truth. And he says this book shows us and his word gives us a divine guidance that I'd walk in truth truth and do that. But not only does it show me how to walk in truth, it checks me when I'm disobedient and it rebukes me when I'm wrong and it shows me when I'm going in the wrong direction. It shows me when the glory is beginning to depart. It shows me when the light of God is becoming dull in my life. It shows me when I'm becoming cold and complacent and indifferent to God and the truths that used to that used to thrill my soul and tickle my inner so to speak as Mountain Dew does to you. Thank God it does something for me that nothing else can do. But now that it's become dull, that it's become dying, that it's become to the place it's no longer exciting to serve God or come to the house of God or to do something for God. The glory is beginning to depart or could I say is departing when that takes place in our life. I am thankful this morning for the statures that we have that directs us and design to do this. And what does it do? For those that obey it, it is right. Presenting the straight road to man's true goal. Thank God I'm glad there's a road that's right. There's a gate that's straight. And you and I today are on the right road when we are serving God and we're doing what pleases Him and praises Him. God took me off the road to hell and put me on the road to heaven. And I'm thankful for that goal that's set before me and the glory that we see on that road and the glory road to heaven that God allows us to walk in day by day. And so we see the law of God, the testimony of God, and the statutes of God. But it gets better. It's building block by block, step by step, closer by closer. We see the commandments of God. Notice you will see here in verse Verse number 8, the latter portion. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eye. David's not only telling us a description of these things and giving us a, des a design of what it is and talking about, but he gives us an attribute of each one of them. The results of each one of them and what takes place once they are in our life. And so this glory is seen in the commandments that tells of the divine decrees and the authoritative and imperious way that God puts before us and wants us to walk. In other words, it enlightens the eyes, illuminating, thank God, the dark world that I was in, removing the blindness from me, and thank God, giving me light for the soul. He's the light of the world. He lights the pathway for you and for me. He illuminates that dark soul that we were walking in that darkness, but we are no longer in that darkness. Why? Because the glory is shining in our life. The glory is there that was not there before. What does it do? It renews the faint in heart. It renews our strength. Sort of like Isaiah tells us about that eagle. They that weigh upon the Lord shall renew thy strength. They shall man up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Thank God for the strengthening hand of God. Thank God for the glory of God that's in our individual life as we walk with Him day by day and we draw our strength from Him to go this way. May God's people see the glory of God in our life. May the glory of God be felt in our life and may the world see the light of Jesus Christ in our hearts and in our soul as we protrude this world that's before us. And so therefore we find that they are pure, the commandments of God, bright like the sun, clear making duty plain. I'm thankful that the word of God is so clear. People tell me, I don't like that King James Bible. I can't understand it. The words are bad. It ain't that you can't understand it. You understand it too good. Why, these words are clear. These words are pure. These words are right. God tells us how to walk. 
God tells us who to worship. He tells us in this precious book. What's so hard about this? You a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What's so hard to understand about this? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, heart man believe unto righteousness with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever shall call upon him shall not be ashamed. So then faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is faith, thank God, by grace, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. What's so hard about I am the way, the truth, and the life? No man coming to the Father but by me. Explain to me what's hard about that. I'm thankful this morning, thank God, for the inspired, inert, pure, perfect Word of God. That's the reason David puts in a nutshell right here all these statues, all these attributes, all these effects that the Word of God, and they're called throughout. You read Psalms 119 when you get a chance, when you get home or sometime this week. That'll tell you about the Word of God. It's mentioned in every word in some form or another. Law, statutes, commandments, perfect, and all this stuff. All the way through that psalm, it's up two verses, and it's referred to... In those two verses. And so therefore I say to you. God's word is what? His law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. The statures of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure. Enlightening the eyes. But then he goes a little further. The fear of the Lord. You said that ain't talking about the word of God. Yes it is. That word fear means reverential trust. And so therefore, the trust of the Lord is what he said. We trust this book. We trust this word. I trust that you are trusting me this morning to tell you the truth. And so therefore, we trust God to tell us the truth. I believe with all my heart and with all my soul that there's no greater truth than the truth I'm preaching to you this morning. And so this word, this glorious word, and the glory that we experience in our life and in our heart and in our walk, the fear of the Lord tells of a settled heart of the soul. Aren't you glad this morning that you can get it settled once and for all? That if the next step you take out of here, you go into glory, you know where you're going. It would have to be a miserable thing for a person to lay his head on his bed at night and not know where you're going to spend eternity. It would have to be a miserable thing for you to have to go out of this church today and not know that you know that you know that you're saved. It would have to be a miserable thing to leave this building today and you not showing the glory of God. But I'm glad, thank God, 51 years ago, going on 52, thank God the glory of God set up his tent in my heart and in my soul. And thank God for 51 years plus, the glory of God's been operating in this preacher. Oh, it's slipped at times. It's got dull at times. The flame has flickered at times, but it's never gone out. And I praise God this morning to say to you that the glory of God is operating in my life. Where is the glory of God in your life? Where is the glory of God in my life? Where's this glory that I'm talking about this morning? Is God getting the glory out of every step? Is God getting the glory out of everything that I do? And so the fear, that reverential trust, tells of the settled heart of the soul, which is informed by the law. It is clean with no foul spot. Thank God you cannot put anything, uh, uh, your finger on anything that's wrong with the word of God. Thank God it is antagonizing corruption and it endures forever for it's the word that's eternal. That's the word of God I'm talking about. But there's one more. You'll notice also he says the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, but the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Righteous together, altogether. That word judgments, that tells of the judicial decisions and sentences of Jehovah. We were in Sunday school this morning. We're in the tribulation period. Thank God that's all the part of the tribulation we're going to be in is to read what's going to happen. But we're talking about the tribulation period. 
In chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, and that crowd that was saved, that 144,000 preaching, uh, the, the flaming evangelists, the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, where the, that crowd got saved and they come out of great tribulation, it says. And as we see around that throne, they were praising God and shouting it out for what he's done. Uh, wh why, why did they get saved? Because they were in the judgments of God on the nation of Israel and on the people that were left behind in the tribulation period. The judgment of God was being poured out. And the judgment of God is judicial. It's the judicial decision that's right and the senses of Jehovah when you stand before God if you're lost and undone without God he's going to say depart from me I never knew you he don't give a flip how good you think you are he don't give a flip what you think you are doing you would better say I know I'm saved by the grace of God and I'm trusting Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior because if you are not then he's going to have to cast you into hell and his judgments are pure they're right and they're true I hear people even this week Week. I had a statement come to me in the form of a question. How could God be so bad uh, to, uh, to let things happen to Israel the way he's having? Let me tell you something, friend. You better get junk that philosophy. You better look to God as the God of grace and the God of glory. And God is just good that he didn't slap you into hell. And he didn't slap me into hell. But his mercy and his grace is seen by his sending his son, Jesus Christ, and giving us the inspired and inert word of God that we could have glory in our hearts and soul that he put there to manifest in this world of the workings of the grace of God. God's just in what he does. He's righteous in what he does. If he slapped the whole world into hell, he'd be just in what he's doing. But thank God he's also a merciful God. And he's a righteous God. And he's a true God. And he's a real God. A judgment that judicial decisions and sentences are true and righteous. They are never false. They're ever faithful and it's vindicated altogether the mutual parts of the word of God and explain and defend one another. This word has no contradictions in it. I was told by a little hotshot preacher, and that's what he was, a little preacher that thought he could preach. Thought he had some sense. And every time his mouth opened, he showed how dumb he was. I was shot, calling me and says, if you're you so smart, Show me in the Bible where we're going to see God. And the Bible says God's a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. I said, no greater statement has ever been made. John, I can tell you where it's at. John chapter 4, verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. I said, now that you're so smart, surely you know this. No man has seen God at any time. But, don't, but let's continue to read. The Son, he hath declared him. You have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and my Father are one. Oh, I can't explain that. Who gives a flip if you can explain it or not? He didn't tell you to, he didn't tell you to explain it. He, he, he said to believe it. And I do believe it. We will never see God the Father in His form as a spirit. But we will see God the Father in Jesus Christ. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. How do I know that? This word is pure, it's perfect, it's true, it's right. And the glory of God, thank God, confirms that. And it defends one another. This scripture does not contradict itself. It complements itself. There are no contradictions in the word of God. None. I love when the person tells me that I just, hand it, I just hand them their Bible. And I said, show it to me. I left a young preacher in a meeting one time, standing on the corner, searching his Bible. That's been years ago. I guess he's still searching it. Because I told him, I said, when you come up with the answer, you let me know. And I haven't heard. I give him my phone number. My phone number ain't changed. I haven't heard a thing from him. Oh, you got to know it all spirit and all. But I do know what I do know. And you may not believe what I know. You, you, not, you may not believe it like I believe it. One thing you leave with a bill in day, you're going to believe that I believe what I believe. <laughs> and so there's the judgments of God. What is it, preacher? Uh, uh, true and righteous altogether. So God is righteous in whatever he does. If I don't hurry up, I won't finish this one. 
So the effects of the word restores the soul, makes wise the simple, rejoices the heart, enlightens the eyes, endures forever, and vindicates altogether. No wonder it's perfect. No wonder it's sure. No wonder David says it's right. It's pure. It's clean and true. What victory the believer has in the Lord. But oh, what value in effect the word of God has in our life. What is that preacher? I mentioned four. The first thing is, there's great possession in the law for those who discover it. Oh, hallelujah. Verse number 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Oh, thank God. I love honey. I don't know about you, and I, I, I hope this doesn't mess you up, <laughs> but, but I used to love when I was a boy, back when I was a boy, but I used to love getting the honey. Come, Granddaddy would go there and cut that old tree and get the honey out of where those bees and get you know you know the story. Get all that out, and Granddaddy would slip me a honeycomb with the honey still in it. Oh my God! I'd put that in my mouth and honey run down on the side of my cheeks. Get on my shirt and my coat and everything else. But when I just chew that thing, and the best part about that honeycomb, you can just chew it and chew it and chew it and chew it and chew it, and it just stick to your teeth. And I love honey. But I found that the hard way. Honey don't love you if you eat too much of it. And, and, and all of you know what I'm, this is not vulgar, but that's one of the best laxatives you can take. And I'm thankful, no wonder the Word of God, it, it, the Word of God, what does that laxative do? It cleans you out. Do I have to get in detail? I can. But it cleans you out. What does the Word, it's a laxative to your soul. It cleans you out. Son, it's sweeter than the honeycomb. It's sweet. The more you eat, the more you taste, and the more you partake of it, the, the more it cleans you. <laughs> and the more, the more you partake of it, the more you have in you, the better it gets. Thank God for the honeycomb of the Word of God. That's how I know the glory of God is in my life. That's how I know, thank God, that's a great possession that I have when I discover that. Gold is good. Fine gold is better. Much fine gold is best. Yet God's word is better than the best and more to be desired than the honeycomb. Not only is it a great possession, but this word of God and the glory of God in our life, it, there, there's abiding pleasure in the law for those who seek it. You've got to discover it. Then you've got to seek it. Honey is good, and the droppings of the honeycomb are very sweet, but the word of God is sweeter still. Then there's, there's a sure protection, great possession, abiding pleasure, sure protection in the law for those who will not only discover it and seek it, but here comes the key, believe it. You've got to believe what I'm telling you. You've got to believe what God's telling us. You've got to trust God and believe this book. The Word of God encourages us. Not only encourages us, it warns us. It not only constrains us, but restrains us. It compels us to follow the right path, but also prevents us from giving way to that which is wrong and going down the wrong path. It opens doors for us, and it closes doors against us. There's another little thing before I wind up. There's... An inestimable profit in the law for those who will obey it. You get it? Discover it. Seek it. Believe it. And obey it. There's the possession, the pleasure, the protection. But thank God the profit. There's much profit for walking in the glory of God. And letting God operate in you. And keeping it great reward. Rewards not for just the future, but in the presence. It rewards of the vision of power and of enlargement of our soul. It rewards not by just keeping the law, but, by, but in keeping the law. How great, how rich, how full, how solemn, how gladsome, how exciting. The book called the Bible that's before us. May the glory of God in his word go through us. So we know that the glory is never going to depart from the skies. The glory is not going to depart from the scripture. But I come now to the finalization of this message. Let me remind you that the ultimate reason God saved me and for you is for his glory. Colossians 1.27. And so we see 
Thank God what a chapter of this Psalm 19 is. The skies tell much, the scripture tells more, but the soul tells most of all. Where is the glory of God in your life? Has it departed? As I said, let me remind you of what the scripture tells us. Colossians 1.27 Christ in you, the hope. Now that's not a hope, I hope I make it to him. I hope I do this, I hope God's good. No, that, let me tell you what that word hope means in that verse of scripture. Same as it does in Romans 8. You know what it means? That is confidence. Christ in you, the confidence. It means trust. Christ in you, the trust. It means that I look forward to him with great assurance. And full expectation that it will take place exactly as the Lord said it would in his word. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let me read it this way. Christ in you, that is Christ in you, the confidence, trust that you look forward to with great assurance and full expectation that it will take place exactly as the Lord said it would in your life. Hope of glory. That's our hope. That's our expectation. Just as God said, it's going to take place. And I praise Him for it. The glory of God in His works. The glory of God in His words. The glory of God in His workmen. It's certainly not gone It's the work of Word of God or the work of God. So if it's gone and it's going to leave, where's it going to leave from? The workman. And God forbid that it does. In the glory of God is exactly what God saved me for and left me here for. Where is that glory in my life? Where is that glory in Calvary Baptist Church? Where is that glory in your life? You say, but I'm saved. I am too, but where is the glory? But I'm a fundamentalist, a fighting fundamentalist. I am too, but where is the glory? I'm against hell's music. I am too, but where is the glory? I'm faithful to the house of God. I am too. But where is his glory? I'm faithful in tithing. I do too. But where is the glory? I think about Moses. Chapter 33 verse 18. When he said, Lord, show me thy glory. What a passage of scripture. And after that prayer in Exodus 34 verse 29. Here's the words. When he came down from the mountain. He wished not that his face did show. Dear God, help us. If you think you got the glory of God in you, you don't. It's sort of like if you think you're humble, you're not. When the glory of God is operating in our life, and the glory of God is shining in our life, Brother Curry, when that glory is operating in the way God wants it to do, we'll not be conscious of it. We'll do our normal walk, our normal worship, working in the will of God, doing what God tells us to do and continuing on with God. But I'm kind to people, preacher. That's one way the glory of God is shown. Where is it in your life? But I have, I'm doing this to help people, preacher. But where is the glory? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 18. But we all with one open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That means simply this, from one degree of glory to a higher degree of glory. That's the life of a true child of God. Is that your life? Is that my life? I am bound for the promised land. Stand and sing it. Not now, but we can stand and shout it out. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? But where's the glory? I'm saved and I know that I am. But where's the glory? I confess, I don't want the glory to depart from this church. I don't want the glory to depart from my life. I want the glory. This church is known as a glory church. Brother Paul Abair's church is a glory church. Brother David Phillips' church is a glory church. And I could name more church, a glory, Brother Sam Mitchell, a glory church. Why? Glory is evident in that place because the presence of God is there in that place. This church, Calvary Baptist Church, I pray to God is a glory church. I pray that this church, that you can feel the power of God in it, the presence of God 
in it. The Lord tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 21 and verse 22, because of the ark of the Lord had been taken from Israel. You remember the story well. The Israelites stole the ark. And the, Philistine, the Philistines stole the ark from the Israelites. There had been a great slaughter among the people. And the two sons of Eli, Hophniz and Phinehas, had died. Eli had fell over and broke his neck and died. What a mess they were in. Phinehas' wife gave birth to a child. And when the child was born, there was presence of what she was doing. She says, not so. You know what she said? She said, I'm calling him Ichabod. You know why she's calling him Ichabod? She tells us in that passage of Scripture. Because the glory, the ark has departed from Israel. In other words, the glory has departed. That's why when we make a statement about Ichabod being written over a church door, the glory has departed. Is Ichabod written over your fart? People are worried about the seal and worried about, worried about the taking the mark of the beast and all that stuff. You don't, you don't, if you're saved, you don't have to worry about that. You ain't going to be here. But they're going to have to receive the mark. Now, I wonder how many children of God should we be more concerned about Ichabod being ridden over our forehead. Not literally, but spiritually. The glory has departed. Now, the glory departed that day. Until the ark returned. Has the Where's the glory in your life? Has it departed? The skies declares glory. Psalms 119, 1 through 6. The scripture declares glory. 7 through 11. Your soul declares his glory. And how can I glorify God? I'll tell you how you can glorify him. I'm just about done. Stay with me. For the fruit of the Spirit is love. Showing the love of God in my life. That shows the glory of God. Joy, having the joy of God in my life and trials and tribulation tests. I told you about dying to myself coming down the road the other day. But there's still joy there. There's still peace there. God's still getting the glory out of it because God's in control. That's how God gets glory. Peace in my heart when I'm going through these things. That's how God gets glory. And take it all the way through that verse. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The nine fruit of the Spirit there. That's how God gets glory. The book of Acts says they, they saw the, gro the grace of God. That's how God got glory. They took notice that they had, disciples had been with Jesus. How did they know that the disciples had been with Jesus, Brother Bill? i tell you how they knew he'd been with Jesus. I'll tell you exactly how they knew. They saw his glory. Is people taking notice you've been with Jesus? People taking notice I've been with Jesus? If you've been with Jesus today, if you talk to Jesus today, has the glory of God in your life today, or is it departing? Or has it departed? Now, let me say, give you some good news. Tammy, come to the piano. Let me, let me give you some, get a song, Mike. Uh, let, let me give you some good news. The good news is the glory can depart from you, but he'll never depart from you. Amen. If you've been saved by the grace of God, you've been sealed to the day of redemption. It's absolutely impossible for a child of God ever to be lost once you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But sad to say, my practice fails from day to day. And sad to say, the light of God doesn't shine as bright in my life some days as it does other days. And sad to say, the glory, I thank God, has not departed. That I can tell, I'm not saying I got it on me, what have you, but I'm saying, as far as I know, the glory is there. I'm not bragging on that whatsoever. May God's people see the glory of God. May the world see the glory of God. May people see the glory of God in our life. But may we not get to the place that we wish not that the Lord, the saddest verse of Scripture in the Bible concerning a child of God is this. As far as I'm concerned. What is it, preacher? I'll tell you exactly what it is. Judges chapter 16 and verse 20. A man named Samson. And he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. How many of us are walking around thinking the glory shining and it ain't even dim? We wish not that the glory has departed. It's pretty simple. Here's the invitation to you this morning. Stand to your feet. If you're here this morning and you're lost and undone without God, you don't have to leave us building lost. You can be saved. But if you've been saved by the grace of God and you know you're saved, can you honestly say, by the grace of God, I want the glory of God in my life. The glory of God's in my life, preaching. And, and, and my testimony, the words I have, 
The places I go, the people I hobnob with, they can see the glory of God in my life. Can you honestly say that? Can you honestly say that? Now, you don't have to worry about being lost if you're saved. That's a done deal. You're in. But you better worry about day by day or be concerned about is the glory of God operating in my life. Are people seeing the glory of God in my life? The things I do, the things I say, the life that I'm living, do they see the glory of God in my life? Is He having His way in your life? Is He walking for you? Is He talking for you? Remember, they've seen the grace of God in the book of Acts and those disciples. How did they see it? The glory was shining. They took notice that they had been with Jesus. How did they take notice of that? They saw the glory of God. Moses' face shone and he wished not that it was shining. How's your life around others? How's your testimony? How are you right with God this morning? How's your walk with God? How's your talk with God? How's your worship with God? I'm going to ask you this point blank question. Do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? Do you know that you know that you know what you're doing is for the glory of God? What are we going to sing? Glory to His name. Number two, glory to His name. I figured that's what it would be. Glory to His name, there to my heart was the blood of glory. That'll be all the singing, that'll be all the playing. I have told you this morning what God put upon my heart. Now I'm going to tell you something, I'm going to be as honest as I can, I don't know no other way to be, I'm going to tell you this, I'm concerned. I'm concerned when it doesn't bother people, when you can preach your heart out. For the glory of God, and you look like a calf at a new gate. I'm not fussing at you. I'm, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned. This altar used to be full with tears and praying, God, don't depart from this church. God, keep the glory flowing. God, keep the power of God in my life. God, help me to be the witness I ought to be. God, help me to be faithful. Help me not to use nanny panty uh, excuses about serving you and doing what you want me to do. I have done as your pastor what God has ordered me to do and given you. I've laid the, laid the word of God out to you this morning. And my, my heart's desire is that the glory is in this place. Woo! And I believe it is. My heart's desire is that the presence of God stay in this place. And I believe it is. My heart's desire is that when you come through those doors, that you continue to say, as Brother Billy has told me and others have told me, there's something about this place. And my heart desires to be, as a young lady told me, to bless my heart and I feasted on all week. I couldn't hardly wait to get to the house of God this morning. I hope it was that way today. I cannot wait to get to the house of God. Is that the way your heart is? You and you alone is the only one knows how you feel towards serving God. Let me tell you something. I'm not fussing at you. I'm not apologizing for what I preached. I'm just telling you this right now. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that every one of you come through those doors. I'm glad that you're sitting on the pew. I'm glad I've got people to preach to. I don't take that for granted, Brother Terry. But I'm going to be the first to throw my hand up to God and tell you I can improve. I love him. I love him because he first loved me. And I praise him this morning for giving me a place to preach, people to preach to. And a book to preach. And truth to stand on. I bless his name and I praise him. I love him. Stand right here and I, I would not embarrass her for one minute. But I was so thankful. I prayed for her year after year after year. God saves Zoe. And God out of nowhere. It won't out of nowhere. God done it. God come a riding on his white horse. But God convicted her. She got saved. Turned her life around for God. Calls Papa all the time. Not all the time, but you know it's a figure of speech. Calls me and asks me, what does this mean, Papa? Taking notes in Sunday school this morning. Mike, you think that don't crank your truck? 
You think that don't help you? A daughter sitting up here on this piano. Thank God playing for the glory, for the glory of God. A song leader right here that, that, that I love and he loves me. And thank God doing what he does for the glory of God. People sitting in this church right here for the glory of God. Coming through that door today for the glory of God. I have no reason to believe that nobody's here today for any other purpose. Other than for the glory of God. But if you are, smack it into hell. Get right with God and leave here with the glow of God in your life. Most of you, I'm done, you know that. M -m -most, most of you are going to leave this place today and you're going somewhere to eat, whether home or somewhere else. Do, do me up. Do your, do your pastor a favor. Will you do this for me, please? Wherever you eat today, go in and smile instead of complain. And when they come to bring your food, do something to make them ask you what you're laughing at, or, don't I? And, ask, and I'm going to ask my way to it. I'm going to embarrass Tammy and Zoe. <laughs> ask, ask them. Ask them when they bring your food, do you see the glory of God in me? Most of them ain't going to have a clue of what you're talking about. And you ain't got to do that. You know, everybody ain't crazy as I am. But have that attitude about you. God bless you. You dismiss. I'll see you Tuesday night, 7 o'clock.